Welcome back to Knowledge is Kings, guys. I am Kings, and today I'm going to be making a table more twisted than my personality. <laughs> Just kidding. That's not possible. But I will be making a twisted table. Now, I will say this was one of the most frustrating projects I have done, but even when I was getting just a smidge upset, I never lost my cool. I remained calm and collective and simply solved my problems. Without further ado, let's get back to the pro Not yet, wait till I'm done talking. Oh, this video is gonna be as bad as the project. Okay, <clears throat> where was I before I was cut off? Oh yeah, project. Okay, now roll. Okay, so after my first test tables I made for this project, I realized that angle accuracy is key. So I sent my design that I made in Fusion to my CNC machine to cut a template for each of the twisted pieces so that everything would work. I love it when I plan ahead like that and nothing works out anyway. There are only two and each will be traced twice. I didn't bother to make a template for the top and the bottom pieces as they were just rectangles. I figured I could make them accurately without a template, but once I got to making them, I was questioning if I could even handle that. So this table actually uses a very small amount of wood, so I used scrap pieces of white oak MDF plywood I had lying around. Each of the two pieces have different angles, and I need to cut that first on the plywood and then line up the template to the short point of that cut and then trace them. Okay, I wanna pause here to explain what I mean by short point. So if you have a board and you have an angle like this, this part here being short is the short point. Conversely, this is the long point. So when I refer to the short point and the long point, that's what I mean. And for this project, I'll have something like this where I have long point to short point. And then this would be long point, point to short point. So if you had a board with an angle like this, this would be long point to long point and short point to short point. Okay, back to video. It is easiest to make those cuts with a track saw. I make the first cut, then set my templates on there just to get a mark for the height where I need to cut the other side. Then I change the angle on the saw, or at least I should have changed the angle, and make the cut for the other side. So the reason I have three sawhorses is so the cut can be centered on the middle one. So once it's cut all the way through, it doesn't fall. So I got a little ahead of myself and traced the templates before I made the cuts. So I had to erase those before I could trace the new ones. It was at this point that I realized I didn't change the angle on the saw before I made the second cut. Nice. Once I cut the correct angle, I lined the template up with the short point of that cut. I trace that one, then use the other template for the other side following the same process. Then I use the track saw to cut each of the pieces precisely on the straight line that will be the long point of the folded angle. Then I cut all the arches for each piece on the bandsaw. And then smooth those curves on the oscillating spindle sander. Now to cut the angle on the straight part of each piece, I took a block and put painter's tape on the face and put tape on the oak piece as well. Then I used instant glue in between the tape to join them together. You could use double-sided tape for this, but it's a lot harder to get apart and can sometimes rip the top ply of the plywood off, so I wouldn't recommend it. The angle for this is too steep for my track saw, so I need to make it on the table saw, and running in a vertical orientation is the only way to do that I set the angle on the table saw and then set the fence until the block just touches the blade. You can see as I make the cut, if I didn't use the block, the piece being cut would fall in between the table saw and the throat plate. I started cutting and realized I had the piece glued on backwards, which as it turns out won't matter because I never actually checked the angle on my table saw, thinking I had, but it was at a different angle from a previous project. So yeah, all the pieces I ran through all have to be remade. Awesome. Once I get the orientations correct, they all need to go through the exact same way with a small tip leading into the table saw. Once I have all those recut, it's time to glue them. I set them next to each other, actually making sure to take one of each variation and taping them together where the top ply of the plywood runs out. 
Then I use the same instant glue to join them together. If this were actual plywood and not MDF core, I would use normal wood glue. Once they are set, which takes about a second, I cut the tips that run long flush with the angle in each side using the appropriately named flush trim saw. Okay, here is a good check to see if the angle was correct. Set a speed square next to it, and it should be square. Here is the first set I cut. Yeah, that was off by a couple degrees. Okay, so I'll take the tape off and you can see just how tight the corners are when you tape them first. As you fold them, the tape stretches slightly, keeping the joint tight. If they weren't tight for some reason, here's what you can do. Take a screwdriver with a round shank and pressing firmly, rub it back and forth over the joint and it will close up the gap and smooth the corner over a bit. It's called burnishing. They actually make a special tool for it, but it's basically just a screwdriver with less functionality. So only buy it so you can tell your friends, that's right, I have a burnishing tool. Do you have one? I didn't think so. It's hard to see here what the burnishing actually does since the joint was tight, but it works great for a slightly loose joint. If the gap is too big, it won't work. Then I sand the corner with 220. Here is a close-up of the corner. With the inside here, you can see there was some glue squeeze out that I later removed with a sharp chisel. Then I double checked the measurement of the bottom to make sure I sized that appropriately. Then I ripped to that size on the table saw and cut it to length on the miter saw. Since this is not solid wood, I need to cover the edges with white oak banding. I just cut this with the scissors and press it with a hot iron, which melts the glue on the back of the backing, sticking it to the wood. I let it hang over all the edges so I can trim it off flush with a tool designed just for that purpose. I take small bits off at a time. If I try to take it all off at once, sometimes it can tear a big chunk out by following the grain instead of cutting through it. Once all the exposed edges are covered, it's time, finally, for glue up. It gets glued up with the same instant glue as before. Once I have the bottom glued on, I glue the top on. See how I only put glue on one piece? Yeah, don't do that. I didn't think ahead that once I set that side, I wouldn't be able to glue the other side. I didn't get it on camera, but I had to carefully break the other side free from the bottom piece and glue it to the top piece. Then I put screws into the bottom for extra strength. If I was using regular wood glue, I wouldn't have had that issue as it doesn't set up right away like the instant glue does. For the finish, I want it to be a lot darker and I thought I could get away with using an all-in-one stain and poly. I typically stray away from all-in-one products because you normally get better results using individual products designed for one thing. But I thought I would save some time. Yeah, I should have gone with my instincts. It turned out so blotchy and streaky I think because I couldn't get the layer thin enough and the stain pigment stayed in the outer layer of what would be the poly instead of soaking into the wood. So I used xylene to remove the top coat of stain and poly after it had set up. So instead of being faster, it ended up taking an extra hour and a half of work. Yeah, you'll have that on these big jobs. Once that was done, I thought, eh, for no reason whatsoever, I will add outlines on the edges with permanent black marker. I actually like the look that this gives it. Then I prepped for a two-part spray-on finish. So I'll be spraying this with a high-volume, low-pressure HVLP gun. And this speedy system really lives up to its name. Add a disposable cup to the outer measuring cup, then add enough of each of the parts, which for me is 10 ounces of the finish, two ounces of the hardener, and two ounces of thinner. Then install the disposable lid, which connects it to the disposable cup. Then add the threaded ring that holds it all together. I need to shake it up to mix it, so I'll also add a plug to the top. Then I head outside and set a platform on a turntable and set my project on that. This will allow it to spin around instead of my hose getting wrapped around it as I try to walk around and spray the project. The cup just slips onto the gun and a simple twist locks it in. It's a lot easier to do this when you're not reaching around over a camera. I keep it upside down and pull the trigger and you can see the cup collapses as air is pulled out. This makes it so I can spray at any angle. It was very hot here in Arizona so the mix was setting up very fast so even though it looks like I'm going over a lot, 
there were no drips or runs. So even though this is a two-part system, I'm sure you noticed I put in three parts. The thinner that I added isn't needed, but this product can be sprayed on a little too thick and it ends up giving the project a plastic feeling. And even though I like it on certain projects, I didn't want it for this one. So the thinner just helps it go on, well, uh, thinner. I let it set up for 15 minutes and then I gave it a very light sanding with 400 grit and put on a second coat. The sanding in between is absolutely necessary for proper adhesion to the previous coats. Once I'm done spraying, I take the cup off the gun and take the disposable cup out and I can just throw it away. This is what the finish looks like if you leave it in the cup. It shrinks considerably. Sounds like the cookies my mom used to make when I was a kid and then as an adult. This was 15 minutes after the second coat. Not only did it harden, but the water already beads up on top of it. Super fast, awesome product. I guess I have to say as well, no, they're not sponsoring me. Just a product that I really like. So that's the end of today's project, but I thought it might be interesting to share what went into doing this project. It starts out as a design in Fusion 360, which then gets sent to my 3D printer at 1 7 of scale. So I have a model to look at while I build a prototype from scrap at half scale. While building the prototype out of scrap wood, I had a test piece or maybe two, or a bunch. Okay, I had a lot. So I had the 3D rendering and some measurements written down, but knowing the angles and understanding the angles are two different things. So with the correct angles, this should have been 90 degrees, but clearly it wasn't. The next piece was 90 degrees, but there was too much gap on the backside. So I went back to Fusion and got every single angle and complementary angle, supplementary angle on the whole project and tried to wrap my head around the ones I need and made a blueprint with everything labeled and from that I was able to make my prototype. This blueprint will be available in the description of this video. One more thing, if you are planning on doing this project or any project, I recommend you grab one of these, an electronic angle finder. This one is accurate up to one tenth of a degree And for the angle it is set to, it gives the supplementary angle as well. Extremely useful for setting angles on your saw. So part of my frustration with the, this project was lack of spatial awareness. I have a hard time envisioning not only the angles, but how the pieces go together once they're cut. Also, my own hastiness and carelessness cause problems and being off by a degree can wreak havoc. So precision is key in this project. With that, this project is going in the advanced playlist of my videos. Even after having a blueprint, it takes some skill to pull this project off. Skill I apparently do not have a lot of. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to like this video as it helps the channel and subscribe so you can be entered into our 10,000 subscriber giveaway. Details are in the description. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next one. Kings, and today I'm gonna to be making a twable. Cut, ah, oh, twable. Oh, I like that.